finish the quote that Tony made at the time, that the best microprobe in the world five years ago was the one with the best, with the smallest spot. He went on to add, and in five years' time, the best microprobe in the world will be the one that's doing the best science. Since his return, about 18 months ago, to Norman, David has contributed very significantly to maintaining the Melbourne microprobe in its rightful position as the best one in the world by doing the best physics. Tonight, he's going to talk to us about not the protons that he has been focusing over all these years, but their prototype for photons, namely light. It's a hard pleasure now to introduce you to tonight's speaker, David Jamison. in focus, 600 million years of progress. In the shallow murky seas of the early Paleozoic era, a tremendous variety of crab-like organisms scuttled about in the, on the sea floor searching for food. Competition for the limited resources was fierce because we see in the fossil record that these organisms called trilobites evolved remarkable eyes. They needed the remarkable to see better in the dim light. They needed to be able to find food, they needed to be able to find predators who were attacking them, and they needed to be able to find other trilobites for the purposes of uh, making other trilobites. I'm going to talk a lot about the trilobite eyes tonight because the trilobites involves a special lens in their eyes to help them see better in the dim light. But what I'm also going to talk about is this in the bottom of the coffee cup. But before I start talking about eyes and uh, mirrors, I want to talk a little bit about mirrors themselves uh, as distinct from eyes. I want to talk about how they work, why they don't work very well sometimes, and what you can do to fix them up. But before I even talk about lenses, I want to talk about a simple way of uh, making images, because that's what we do with lenses we make images. A simple way of making images that uh, doesn't use a lens. Right, oh, gee, that worked the first time every time I make this. <laughs> what we've got here is simply an object that's well illuminated. Over here. And so every point on the object is producing reflected light, and that reflected light is coming over here and impinging on a screen. Now what we want to be able to do is make an image of that object on the screen. And without anything in between the object and the screen, the screen just is covered by a whole overlapping series of images, if you like, so that it's just uniform, uniformly illuminated by the reflected light. The simplest possible way to make an image on that screen is simply to put a pinhole in between. And the knowledge of how to make an image with a pinhole has been around for a long, long time, since antiquity. This is a page from one of uh, Leonardo's notebooks showing how to make an image using a pinhole. So you've got light coming in here, passing through the pinhole, and making an image down here. does is just select out one possible light ray coming from each possible point on the object and allowing it through onto the screen. So instead of a whole sequence of overlapping images, you just get one. It's obviously it's fairly obvious that the image made in this way is going to be upside down because 
as you see, light from the top of the object has to pass down to get through the pinhole onto the screen, and light from the bottom of the object has to pass up to get through the uh, pinhole to get onto the screen. Now, uh, this, this was exploited by early artists who wanted to paint uh, pictures accurately, and you could, uh, that what they did was take a room, block out all the windows, uh, paint one wall white, and make a small hole in one of the blinds covering the windows opposite the white wall, and they would get an inverted image of the external scene on that wall, which they would then paint. And that was called a camera obscura. There's actually quite a few natural camera obscuras all around us called trees. The strange things happen, the strange thing happens with trees when the uh, sun shines on them. The tree canopy of leaves is not completely continuous, and there are a few places where there's a chink where a light beam can go all the way through from the sun through the canopy and onto the ground. And that little chink acts like a pinhole camera obscura and casts a circular image of the sun on the ground. But you'd never know it was happening unless you're looking for it because all those dappled overlapping images don't look <coughs> terribly distinctive. Unless there's an eclipse of the sun underway. <coughs> this is a cover from a recent Australian physicist. And here's a photo of the shadow underneath a tree taken during an eclipse of the sun by the moon. And you can see that all the little Images of the sun that have been cast onto the wall here and onto the ground look a little bit banana shaped. And they look banana shaped not because of the overlapping leaves, they look banana shaped because the sun is starting to be bitten into, in this case it's almost completely covered, as the moon moves across it. So the tree is casting a whole series of pinhole images of the eclipse of the sun on the wall. Now, Pinhole, a pinhole is obviously a remarkable simple, simple, a remarkably simple way of forming an image, but the image quality leaves an awful lot to be desired because fairly obviously you're chucking away most of your light and throwing it away on the screen around the pinhole. You're only letting through one light ray from each point. Not only that, the uh, resolution of the image is dictated by the size of the pinhole and how far away it is from the screen, and a sharp point on the object, in fact, gets imaged as a fuzzy blob over here on the screen. And you can think, well, we can do one thing to improve the pinhole camera. Uh, we can improve the image cast by the pinhole simply by closing the pinhole down. Well, unfortunately, that uh, doesn't work because when you close the pinhole down beyond a certain limit, the light starts diffracting through the pinhole. Now, if I could have the uh, laser on up the back there, I've got a laser set up right at the back of the theatre. And uh, there it is. That's the laser spot on the, uh, on the screen up here. And I've got a diaphragm over the front of the laser. And Steve, if you wouldn't mind just closing that diaphragm down. So we're putting a pinhole now in front of the laser. And you notice that as the diaphragm closes down, you start getting, instead of a smaller blob, can you close that down again? Yeah. Instead of a smaller blob, you're getting this peculiar looking pattern. That's actually meant to happen. That's diffraction. The light is diffracting through the pinhole, and it's forming on the screen here an interference pattern. If you can close that diaphragm down as small as possible, Steve, you'll notice that peculiar things are happening here that can only be explained by the wave nature of light. And you've actually got a dark spot in the middle of the hole, surrounded by a bright, series of rings that form the interference pattern. So if you close your pinhole down so that you start to get effects like that, your image cast by your pinhole camera will go out of focus. Nevertheless, we can use a pinhole to take quite a good picture. And if I could get, um, well, I won't, I won't call for a volunteer, I'll take a picture of everybody <coughs> using nothing more than a pinhole. I've got a modified Polaroid camera here where I've just taken off the lens and thrown it away. And I'll just get this started. Now, we have to very carefully time the exposure because we need a uh, carefully calculated three seconds here. So let me just uh, start the timer. One cat dog, two cat dogs, three cat dogs. <laughs> be careful not to open the shutter again. And you, uh, you hold on to this for 45 seconds or thereabouts. And uh, hopefully.
obviously, when you want to improve your image beyond what is available with the pinhole, you have to put in a lens. <laughs> and maybe uh, afterwards, we can, if anyone wants their portrait taken with the pinhole camera, I'll be very happy to uh, do that for you. So the image quality is actually quite good uh, with this particular pinhole, which I made by just uh, poking the pin through a piece of aluminum foil. The trouble is, I had to use a three-second exposure, so you couldn't use this as a practical camera because any motion would uh, come out very blurry. You need to go a lot faster. You need to use a much shorter exposure. And of course, that's where the lens comes in. Now, the, uh, the simplest type of lens is simply a biconvex lens, as I've drawn here. And each face has a spherical profile. And the reason why each face has a spherical profile in a, in a simple lens is because it's very easy to make a spherical profile. And Unfortunately, though, spherical profiles are not ideal for forming images. Nevertheless, in last week's sun, this uh, lady discovered that a glass spherical vase filled with water placed on the windowsill with the sun shining on it was able to focus an image of the sun onto her curtain, which is not a good idea because there's a lot of power <laughs> in the sunlight and she discovered that this experiment was underway from the very strong smell of burning curtain. And had she not been home at the time, uh, her house would have burned down. So be very careful, don't, if you get given a spherical vase by a close friend, suspect their motives. <laughs> I've also got a spherical, a spherical biconvex lens in the smoke box here. Okay, those of you who can't see what's going on in the smoke box, take a look up here on the uh, TV. What's happening is that the light from this laser, I'm just passing it through a diffraction grating to make a whole series of beams, and they're passing through a simple biconvex lens, and it's bending them, and it's bending the outside ones more than it's bending the middle one, and the rays are coming down to a focus right there. So that's an example of uh, a simple way of... Uh, of focusing light with a focus <coughs> lens. But there, there's more going on than meets the eye here because the strength of this lens, that is to say how, how tightly it focuses the light, how close to the lens the image is where the rays converge here, depends on the properties of the material. It depends on a property called refractive index. In fact, more importantly, it depends on the difference in the refractive index between the material of that lens, which in fact is uh, perspex, and the air surrounding it. And so, before I discuss this more, I'll go and treat a much simpler imaging system, which is where we just use a uh, concave mirror. You can form a nice image with a concave mirror. It's very easy to make a concave mirror, because all you have to do is start with two cylindrical blanks of glass, put a thin paste of grinding material between them, and just sort of go like this for a few months. And eventually, <laughs> eventually the bottom blank will be ground to a convex shape, and the top blank will be 
ground to a concave flank, a concave uh, mirror. And, and the only reason why that works is because a spherical shape always fits together. Two spherical shapes always fit together regardless of their orientation. So if I've got here two spheres, <coughs> here's one sphere, that's a convex one, here's a concave one, it doesn't matter how I fit them together, what orientation I choose, that they always fit. And it doesn't, if there are any lumps or bumps or something, irregularity sticking out on this one, eventually they'll get preferentially eroded away until they fit together really nicely. And there was, um, on the ABC program of astronomers last week, uh, we saw people grinding mirrors for telescopes doing exactly that. Over here, I have a very large <coughs> concave mirror, which, was, uh, which I could use to make an image. So I've got a red light in the box here. And I think people who can see into the uh, mirror <coughs> should be able to see an image of the red light somewhere around here. OK, I'll, uh, I can pass that off the screen for those of you who are not uh, oriented. formed by the concave mirror. <coughs> and that's a real image because the light rays actually converge at that point. And it really does look like it's there. And I urge you, if you can't see it, clearly, come down and take a look at that after the lecture. The spherical shape, like that one over there, works really well for making images, providing you don't use too much of the shape. You want to make sure that the curvature is very shallow so you're only using a small segment of the, the whole sphere of which this is part. Because as soon as you start using more than just a small, shallowly curved bit of it, you start to have problems. That's what we see here. I put the sun shining into this coffee cup, and in the cross section, this is a, well, this is a cylindrical wall, and the uh, the sun is hitting the cylindrical wall, so that's like a uh, two-dimensional uh, sphere. You know, it's just a circle, a segment of a circle, and being focused onto the bottom of the cup. And you can see that it's not the sun isn't being focused to a point like you'd hope if you were going to make an image. It's being the light from the sun is being scattered all around the bottom of the cup, and we get this very nice shape, which is called a corsphere. And this caustic is in fact a spherical aberration caustic because it's characteristic of the shape that you're using to focus the light. This uh, knowledge about this uh, spherical aberration caustic has been around for a long time. And again here I have a page from Leonardo's notebook. And uh, Leonardo has uh, constructed a diagram here showing light, parallel light coming down hitting a spherical surface and coming back and focusing to a caustic. You can see him in a preliminary stage of construction down here. It resembles, it resembles very nicely the spherical aberration caustic we see in the bottom of the coffee cup. This, um, this diagram of the spherical aberration caustic crops up in the scientific literature all through the ages. Here's an early one that uh, originated from the, uh, from the Arabs, actually. Who know, this is not a caustic, actually. I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the, the correct shape to use, to which the sphere, the spherical shape, is only an approximation, has been known since uh, the ancient Greeks. And it's known to be what they call a conic section, in other words, a parabola. And this, this diagram here shows what happens if you have parallel light shining down in a parabola, not a sphere anymore, you can see the rays coming back and converging to a point. So that's the shape you should use to focus light to a point. Now in the scientific literature of around 2,000 years ago, our library goes back a long way, there's a very interesting paper which was published by an ancient Greek mathematician called Diocles. The paper was called Diocles on Burning Mirrors where he suggests a, a new and potentially very deadly Star Wars type directed energy weapon. <laughs> Diocles' work has
has come down to us as an Arabic translation of a lost Greek original. And Diocles points out the problem with the spherical mirror and points out how the sun's light, if you try and use this mirror for focusing, gets scattered all around the place to make this stick and doesn't get focused to a point. And he treats mathematically the correct description of the shape you need to focus the sun's light to a point, the, the parabola, the conic section. And legend has it that these the mirrors made from uh, uh, conic sections, parabolas, were used by Archimedes uh, in the form of this uh, directed energy weapon to focus the sun's light onto invading Roman ships, triremes, <laughs> the most deadly weapon of the age. So we're talking about 200 BC here. And this, uh, this engraving from the literature shows the mirrors in operation. Here's the sun up here, shining down on the mirrors on the uh, coastal city, and the light being focused down onto the invading ships. You can see the ships kind of catching fire in the most satisfying manner. <laughs> now, I did a few calculations as to how Archimedes could have achieved this. At the latitude of the Mediterranean, sunlight in the middle of the day has an intensity of about 1,400 watts per square metre. And a mirror, say, 20 metres in diameter, shouldn't be too unmanageable, with a focal length of around 100 metres. And I chose 100 metres in consultation with a relative who's a member of an archery club. 100 metres is about the length of an accurate bow shot. Okay, so you want to set the ships on fire before they get within 100 metres of you, otherwise you're in trouble. <laughs> and such a metre, 20 metres in diameter, parabolic, would focus about 400 kilowatts of power onto the ships, and surely, since the ships were made of wood, that would be enough to set them on fire. The trouble is, any perturbation from the parabolic shape would end up with severe aberrations, like the spherical aberration shown in the coffee cup here, and you wouldn't get that 400 kilowatts into one spot, and so the thing wouldn't work. So you'd have to get it spot on, otherwise you'd be in trouble. And I don't think the ancient Greeks would have had the technology to make a 20 metre diameter parabolic mirror. But there's an intriguing little footnote on this legend that uh, makes, it uh, makes it more believable. In the 6th century, a Byzantine architect called Anthemus of Trails states that Archimedes did the job with a whole collection of small flat mirrors. Perhaps this is what he had in mind. <coughs> this is a Cherenkov telescope, which is for collecting light emitted by particles moving faster than the speed of light at the top of the Earth's atmosphere and focusing them onto a detector at the focus of the telescope up here. And you can see that the telescope consists of innumerable little flat mirrors. And so I would suggest that Archimedes probably had a squad of mathematically inclined soldiers, specially trained, to hold up <laughs> shiny, polished, bronze shields in the shape of a parabola, that's why they have to be mathematically inclined, and focus the ship in light onto the uh, invading ships. Now, I realise probably most people here are fairly mathematically inclined, so I actually have the sun here. Now, I'm sorry, that's very bright, but if you reach under your seat, you will find a mirror.
and you'll hear the shrieks of the soldiers on the ship getting louder and louder as more and more of you manage to get your light onto the mirror, onto the ship, not onto the ship. Okay, now for the other rows, uh, we need to try and do the same. So if I get everyone in the front row to hold their mirrors steady, and the other rows, put the light on the roof first, find out which spot's yours, and bring it down. Okay, look. Well, some of you, I don't think you're trying very hard. <laughs> look, here, here they come. Romans in the ship. And they're about to do this to you unless you get it right. <laughs> sensational discoveries and it's not generally accepted that he did discover more than he knew. This is a picture of two of his telescopes that are fairly primitive, the homemade, they were the first ones. Um, and this is a page from his notebook where he was recording his observations of the sky, things that he saw through his telescope. Um, Galileo made his telescope from lenses, biconvex lenses with a spherical shape. And in his notebook here, he's recording the position of the moons of Jupiter, so that's what all these little dots represent. 
And he also recorded the position of a few stars that went past in the field of view. Uh, that's what this thing is here. It's a star that happened to be going past Jupiter while he was observing the uh, moons. And this, um, some astronomers got hold of this notebook and they wondered what star this was that Galileo was looking at while he was looking at Jupiter. And they couldn't find any stars in the catalogue. But it must have been pretty bright because these telescopes were fairly primitive. So they did a few calculations and they realized the star they saw that Galileo was looking at was actually the planet Neptune. So Neptune, which wasn't discovered for another 200 years, was actually seen by Galileo in his telescopes with these primitive spherical-based lenses. Johann Kepler, who was very impressed with Galileo's discoveries, wrote an analysis of the optics of uh, Galileo's telescope and pointed out that he'd do a lot better if he could correct the spherical aberration of his uh, telescope lenses. And he suggested the shape of lens that you would need to do that. Uh, I'm talking now about not shaping the original lenses, I'm talking about putting in an extra lens to correct the aberration. And uh, he said it would have to be an aspherical shape, so if the shape would not have this property, and he went on to lament that actually there wasn't anyone around at the time who could make that shape accurately enough to do any good, it was well beyond the technology of the 17th century. Along came Isaac Newton, and in typical style in his book on optics in 1704, he says, the imperfection of telescopes is vulgarly attributed to spherical figures of the glasses, and therefore mathematicians have propounded to figure them by the conic sections. Newton did a lot of experiments that showed that the limiting aberration for a telescope lens was in fact chromatic aberration, the tendency of light of different colours to focus at different points and so produce images which have got coloured fringes around them. And he said, well, we can take care of the, uh, the, the chromatic aberration by simply making our telescope lenses, telescope uh, not out of lenses, but out of mirrors. And in fact, all the big astronomical telescopes today are made from mirrors. Um, but again, the spherical mirror always suffers from spherical aberration. Newton made mirrors for his own telescopes himself, and he includes about a two-page diatribe in his book against the mirror makers of London because they couldn't make a nice, smooth, shiny mirror for him. Uh, it's kind of unusual to put diatribes like that in scientific papers today. Not that we wouldn't like to, it's just not done. <laughs> Unfortunately, mirrors, um, Newton's mirrors tarnished very quickly because the metal surfaces became oxidized, and so his uh, mirrors, although they were, had tremendous magnifying power, uh, didn't produce better images than glass lens. Uh, telescopes like uh, Galileo's. There is, however, a new telescope which does have a mirror which is not spherical, a mirror which has been ground very, very carefully <laughs> to an aspheric shape so that the spherical aberration would be completely eliminated. And this aspheric shape was ground by computer-controlled milling machines to a precision of only three atomic diameters. And the mirror is nearly two meters in diameter. They managed to get the shape accurate to what was asked for, to an accuracy of three atomic diameters. Unfortunately, they asked for just slightly the wrong shape. <laughs> <laughs> the pupils did the job absolutely spot on, but the feedback they were using, that the computers were relying on to tell them how close they were getting to the right shape was a little bit out. And so, and that was because of uh, uh, a budget cut which uh, prevented them from actually testing the thing before they launched it. <laughs> and they didn't discover it until, uh, until after it was up in space. But not to worry, it's still an excellent telescope lens and because they know the profile of the aspheric shape accurate to three atomic diameters, it should be a simple job in a future shuttle mission to put in a small um, correction mirror at the primary focus in order to take out the effect of the uh, errors. So it's not by any means a disaster. It's, and incidentally, there have been a lot of recent uh, exciting results from the Hubble Space Telescope um, because it is out for in the most perfect viewing conditions imaginable in outer space. It does see very bright images. We can, uh, having filled you in on uh, the various uh, 
ways of getting things in focus and the problems with those, we can now turn back to lenses. And I want to talk about eyes. Eyes um, are fairly uh, complicated things. That uh, with, with just air inside the prism here, nothing much is going on. The laser beam is just passing straight through. We've got air on the outside, which has a refractive index of one. We've got air on the inside, which has a refractive index of one. The light passes straight through. Now, if I tip a bit of uh, water in there, remember I haven't done this before, so. that the, the water, which has a refractive index of 1.3 or thereabouts, has caused the laser light to be substantially bent. Now, I did have a pen, but... Uh, oh, yeah, it's gone way up there. Okay, it's gone over the top of the safety shield here, so, you know, if you're climbing up the wall, don't look, right? Water, as I said, 1.33 compared to air 1. Let me let the water out. And uh, I really should mark that with something. I'll just put a little mark there so I can refer to it later. I'll let the water out, and I'll replace it with something that's got a much higher refractive index, a material called carbon disulfide, which has a refractive index of about uh, 1.7 or thereabouts. So it's substantially higher than uh, water. Should have made a bigger hole in the tap, I must remember that for next time. The, um, Carbon disulfide is a very dense uh, viscous material and it's got a refractive index approaching that of, uh, well, actually higher than some glass. Carbon disulfide is so large that it's, uh, it's caused 
the, light, the laser light to dim by a tremendous amount. So, organisms that live in air can actually use water, water-filled lenses, a membrane, a spherical membrane, with water behind it, to focus light. <coughs> organisms that live in water have to use something optically more dense than, um, than water. In fact, they have to use stuff that's more like rock, like calcite, for example, which has a refractive index of about 1.66. Let me go back to the human eye again for a moment. Uh, oh, there's the, that's the Hubble mirror. They're just taking a look at it, uh, trying to see if there are any errors. <laughs> not just a simple spherical surface. And the reason why it's not just a simple spherical surface is, of course, because of spherical aberration. I just push the button here, do I? So I first. I've got a computer simulation here which shows what happens if you try and focus light with a spherical surface. A spherical interface. So imagine you've got air out here and some kind of liquid in here, and there's the interface. And there's some light that's coming in and it's focused over here somewhere. And there's some more light coming in which is, which is hitting the interface closer to the edges. It's focusing way over there. We're not doing too badly so far. Most of these rays we get further and further towards the edge. They're all coming in over here. But I want you to see what happens as light starts to come in around the edge of the eye, uh, the edge of the interface. You'll notice that the focus here is starting to creep back this way a bit. And that's because of the spherical aberration of this spherical interface. Remember, we've got air out here and water or glass or something inside here. And the further off towards the edges we go, the further back towards the interface the focus comes. Until we get, okay, there's the whole light. In case you missed the subtle uh, change in focus there. We've got the whole light coming here. You can see the outside ones are focusing here and the inside ones are focusing down there. So if we try and look at things with an eye made out of a uh, spherical front, things should look very blurry. You see bright spots with halos around them. The shape you need to get the ideal focusing for parallel light coming into your eye, so that's light from objects which are a long way away, is in fact an elliptical interface. 
So I've replaced the spherical interface now with an ellipse, and the shape of the ellipse has to be carefully chosen because it depends on the refractive index of the material on this side compared to the material on this side. And although this is a bit subtle, you'll see that uh, maybe I'll just zoom out here a bit. You'll see that the, all the rays are coming in and they're focusing at the same point. <coughs> Slow down the glass, round my arm. Okay, there they are. They all came in. You see, they've all focused to the same point. <coughs> That's what an elliptical interface does for parallel light coming in from a long way away. But the cornea, the eye, the human eye is called upon to do more than just look at things a long way away. You've got to look at things out the corner of your eye that way, out the corner of your eye that way. You've got to look at things up close. And so um, the shape of the cornea is actually a compromise. It's kind of like a flattened hyperbola. And there's a fair bit of uh, fine tuning done by the other, the other components um, inside the eye. Let me just uh, summarize all those refractive indices for you in case uh, you miss some of those. Okay, so this is a uh, cross section of an eye. Um, you can see we've got air out here, refractive index 1, or here in here, refractive index 1.8, aqueous humor. There's the lens itself. The lens itself is actually shaped a bit like um, an onion in cross section. structure. It's a very, very complex and ingenious device. And it's used, the lens of the eye, it's not used for doing the primary focusing. It's used only for zooming in on things. And it zooms in on things because it's got muscles attached to the rib, which allow the shape to be changed. Okay, so it can be squashed for looking at things that are up close, or it can be stretched for looking at things that are a long way away. And as we get older, the uh, that lens becomes kind of hardened and does not quite so squishy and uh, you can't focus on things up close anymore because you can't squash it down as hard as you used to be able to and so you have to wear glasses if you want to look at uh, things up close and of course many other defects that uh, can occur. Let me get back now to organisms that live in water. As I said, organisms that live in water can't use a water-filled membrane like the cornea to do their focusing because they already live in a medium that's got a refractive index of 1.33. They have to use much more dense materials like calcite. And in fact, if you get a squid and you uh, borrow its eyes for a moment and stick them in a little jar, oops, wrong way, um, they actually rattle when you shake them. Okay, that's how dense they are, how hard they are. And these are some uh, slides I borrowed from Bill Jager from Monash, who does experiments with uh, eyes. And this is a squid's eye immersed in water. It must be immersed in water to function correctly. If you tried to use a squid's eye to focus in air, the light would uh, converge much too close up here, OK? It's too strong for use in air. It has to be used in water. And you can see the light coming in focused over here. The squid doesn't use a cornea. It uses a lens, as I said, made of calcite, which is much denser than the water. And uh, Bill was interested in measuring the chromatic aberration of these eyes, amongst other things. So he fires these laser beams in different colours and measures where they come to a focus. You can see the effect of the refractive index difference between the medium in which the lens is immersed and the uh, material of the lens. Over here again, I've, uh, I think you can still see the, uh, maybe, can I put this back on the camera? Just, just put on. This is uh, for those of you who can't see quite what's going on. So I've got, uh, you can still see the light coming to a focus there in the uh, box here. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace the air in this box with a different medium. In fact, water. Um, I've just positioned that pointer there exactly where the, well, close enough to where the light uh, comes into focus. Okay, I'll put this screen here and you can see the uh, laser light converging down and coming to a focus about where I put that marker. If I now fill this with, uh, we're economizing on tubing again here. <laughs> water 
brushes in. We uh, change the difference in refractive index between the lens and the surrounding medium. And uh, the lens starts to get into trouble. You can see this also if you buy an underwater camera. This uh, is an underwater camera. And it has to have a special lens on it so that it uh, gives, behaves in the way you'd expect. This has got a 35mm um, lens, and when you stick this in water, that behaves just like a 50mm lens would in air, because the, the effect of the water weakens the focal length of the lens, weakens the lens, lengthens its focal length. How are we going with the water? Okay, so, alright, so let's, while we're waiting for the water to uh, fill the tank there, let's go back to the trilobites that we uh, started off the lecture with. What I want to do is uh, zoom in and take a quick look at these guys' eyes. The uh, whole trial of eyes is only uh, a few centimetres long. They weren't very large, but there's millions and millions of them in the uh, fossil record. Um, their eyes are compound eyes, just like insects are today. And each little segment is a lens. Now, let's see if I've got This is a close-up of the trilobite eye from, a, from the fossil record. And we're going to take a close look at just one of the individual little lenses here. There's a whole array of these things that form the compound eye. We'll just take a look at one of them. It turns out that the evolutionary forces that were driving these trilobites to be more and more successful in their murky water, the need for more and more light gathering power, meant that although they started off with a spherical front surface of their eye, which was in fact made out of calcite, it's an excellent material for being preserved in the fossil record because it's already a rock. It wasn't enough. The spherical surface wasn't enough. They couldn't see well enough. So what they did, they evolved an extra lens inside the eye, at the back of the front of the eye, which had an aspheric shape and corrected the spherical aberration of the spherical front surface. And by a truly astounding uh, coincidence at first, if you take a look in a publication by Descartes, who was a French mathematician, this is a picture of a cross-section of a trilobite eye, just one of those little lenses, and you can see this aspheric extra interface that the trilobite involved in order to focus light coming in here and converge it onto the retina, which is uh, down here underneath the back of the eye you find that Descartes had come to the same conclusion. Oh, sorry, this is Huygens. Uh, it's Descartes here. Yeah. Huygens, just by looking at the way light behaved in going from one medium to another, just by looking at experiments like this, was able to deduce what sort of shape you need to correct the spherical aberration. And later on, I've been saying that uh, Descartes came to the same conclusion. Huygens' work was done with fairly thick lenses that were fairly sharply curved. Descartes did some work with fairly thin lenses that weren't so sharply curved, and he came up with this different shape. This is the aspheric shape, which is correcting the spherical aberration of the front spherical shape. And sure enough, in the fossil record, we see trilobites with eyes based on that design. And this is one of them, a, um, a scanning electron micrograph of uh, trilobite eye from the fossil record. And you can see that the front part of the lens, the uh, calcite part was actually lifted off and you can see the little aspheric shapes at the back which were used to correct the aberration. Now these eyes were astoundingly good. They in fact, I want to try and give you an idea of how good they were and I'll appeal to your basic instincts, in, in fact money, to get an idea of how good these lenses were, I put up here a fast camera price list. If you go into a camera shop, I'll have to I'll move that up this way. If you go into a camera shop and say you want to buy a Nikon lens for your camera, which has an aperture of f1.8, this is the way you determine how good the lens is by looking at the f number, which tells you how much light the lens will gather. So an f number of 1.8 is a moderately good lens for gathering quite a bit of light, not the best you can get, as we'll see, but that'll set you back about $160. 
if you if you want to take pictures in low light and you want a lens that's better, bigger, gathers more light, so you don't have to use such long exposures on your film, you can buy a Nikon 50 millimeter lens. This is the uh, standard focus. Mm -hmm. F1.4, the aperture is now getting bigger. This number is inversely proportional to the size of the aperture. And that will set you back $490. If you really, really press and this is not good enough and you want to take pictures of rock stars at concerts, you'll need a lens of around F1.2. This is not easy to come by. That will set you back $670 for the lens. And, you know, if you're really, you're really if you're trying to get a picture of... Um, you know, your favourite rock star and you just can't get it, you're needing a two second exposure or something with your f1.2 lens, then Canon will provide you with an f1 lens, which has now got four times the light gathering power, roughly, of the Nikon 1.8. That's going to set you back $3,200. And you better have arms like Superman, because it's got an enormous glass front on it that weighs a ton. <laughs> the human eye, by contrast, the focal length is about 17 millimetres, has an F number of about F2.1, <coughs> two of those three. <laughs> Trilobite eye has a focal length of a few millimetres, but it has an F number of about 1.1. That's this eye right here with the correction element at the back of the spherical front interface. That's almost as good as the best, most expensive, fastest lens you can buy, the Canon F1. Unfortunately, they're extinct. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of how difficult it is to increase the F number, the Anglo-Australian Telescope, which is a gigantic 3.9 metre uh, mirror, um, has a focal length of 12.7 uh, metres. It's got that F number of uh, F3.3. That, because that was so big, that sent them back uh, quite a few million dollars. So you can see from this scale of F numbers, the trial bites did outstandingly well. And in fact, there aren't too many lenses, uh, eyes, I should say, around today that are as good as the trilobites were in their ocean 600 million years ago. All of the mirrors and lenses we've talked about today have involved actually putting lumps of matter in, grabbing the light. Oh, shit. Before I go on, I should have a look over here. You can see what's happened now. The, uh, the uh, water has... Uh, Oh, it's hitting the marker, I'm taking the marker out now. The uh, water has changed the focal properties of that lens. And you can see it's now made it tremendously weak, right? See, look, it's, it's not even managing to converge the laser light before the end of the fish tank. So we've, we've drastically changed the focal properties of that lens by immersing it in water. Such a lens would obviously be no good. A lens made out of that material would be no good for something living in water. So you can see the importance of this having a large difference between the refractive index of the lens and the medium in which you live. Okay, as I said, all of the uh, lenses and mirrors we've talked about today have involved putting lumps of matter in the way of the light to modify its properties to force it to a focus. Is there any way of bringing things into a focus without using actual lumps of matter directly to influence the path of light? And the answer is yes. In uh, 1915, Einstein published his paper on general relativity, which described how a strong gravitational field could have the effect of bending rays of light, created a sensation, and he made the outrageous prediction that starlight, which came to the Earth via a uh, close path over the surface of the sun, would actually be made to bend by the, be made to bend by the sun's gravitational field. Such an outrageous prediction uh, needs to be tested. An expedition was dispatched as soon as possible after the First World War <coughs> to observe an eclipse because if you're going to look at starlight near the sun, you've got to make sure you black out the sun. The best way of doing that is to wait for an eclipse of the sun by the moon. Eddington went to some exotic location <coughs> in the South Seas. We must have been really rugged. And uh, observed by looking at the sun that starlight was in fact bent as the starlight raised the surface of the sun on the way to Earth. The starlight was being bent by the, the intense magnetic field of the sun. It was a very subtle bend. Nevertheless, it confirmed, seemed to confirm Einstein's prediction extremely well. Einstein predicted that uh, later in about the 30s, he, he predicted that if you've got a chance of alignment between two stars, so you've got a distant star, 
and you happen to get a heavy star between you and that distant star, you should form a ring of light as the heavy star in the foreground bent the light and focused it into a kind of ring. But he thought that it would be very unlikely that you would ever see this. Uh, to give you an idea of what a heavy object would do to some light, this is a giant billboard out in space. And uh, a giant billboard with Einstein's name in it, and there's a very heavy star that's just passed in front of our field of view, and it's causing a distortion of the light traveling from the billboard towards our eyes. We have to go out of space to do this because we need gigantic gravitational fields to have any effect. No one's ever observed a ring caused by starlight bending in the gravitational field of another star. Um, let me just show you what it would look like, though, if you could see it. Um, the gravitational effect of a heavy object is just like the effect the bottom of a wine glass has on light. So I went over to our, we physicists don't know very much about wine glasses, we work a lot. So I borrowed one from some colleagues in the arts. <laughs> <laughs> here's, a, here's a wine glass, here's a, here's a star, okay, that's a little spot on a piece of paper. And let me just move the, uh, the wine glass over the spot, okay, there it is, you can see that you're getting a little bit of distortion of the shape of the spot as the bottom of the wine glass moves over it. Until I reach a point, and it's a bit hard to see here, but the spot is underneath the wine glass and it's been imaged in three places. There it is over there, pretty distorted. There it is there, and there it is again around the back, pretty distorted once again. So that's where the dot and the bottom of the wine glass are not perfectly aligned. But if I now perfectly align the dot and the bottom of the wine glass, we see that instead of getting a dot now, we get a ring of light blue ring, because it was a blue dot originally, imaged by the bottom of the wine glass, the optical analogy of the strong gravitational field. Just recently, out in space, in the constellation of Leo, this has been observed. Not in visible light and radio waves, I think, but it seems to be the first occurrence of an Einstein ring. And it hasn't occurred between two stars, it's occurred between a very, very distant quasar, I think it is, and some sort of massive galaxy where you get a dense alignment, almost a precise alignment. The massive galaxy has bent the light from the quasar into this ring. First observed Einstein ring. The light from that quasar started its journey to Earth for us to observe in that shape about three billion years ago long before the trilobites were swimming around in their Paleozoic oceans about 600 million years ago. The trilobites eventually became extinct and they passed on their inherent, their eyes, the compound eyes to, uh, to insects and uh, some of the other aspects they passed on to squids, the fact that the front of the eye was uh, made of calcite in particular. So we can see that Although the uh, focusing of light is not actually very straightforward, it's nevertheless accomplished very well from organisms swimming around in their oceans to massive galaxies out in uh, deep space. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
to ask you, because I forgot to mention how you see underwater. What happens when you go underwater is the refractive index between your cornea and the water is, there's no difference. So the cornea doesn't do any focusing anymore. Your eye then functions like a pinhole camera, the pinhole being the pupil, the iris that is casting an image on your retina. And so things are very blurry. And you have to put that air cornea interface back by wearing a face mask before you can see properly. Otherwise, your eye just functions like a, a pinhole camera. And the image quality leaves a lot to be desired. You have compared the lenses from cameras, our eyes, tripod eyes. What about eagle eyes? Um, yeah, I, I haven't actually investigated eagle eyes, but I imagine they, uh, I can't really say very much about them, but I imagine they have uh, maybe not uh, superior light gathering power, but they certainly have maybe a more densely packed pixel array on their retina, so they get uh, better resolution probably. I suppose that would have to be matched with uh, good optics. It's hard, the, another thing I forgot to mention was that it's hard actually to improve the human eye. You can make it more specialised, but you can't improve it that much because we see already close to the quantum limit. The quantum limit, both from the point of view of resolution um, and also from the point of view of sensitivity. Uh, it only takes about 100 photons entering the eye for us to perceive a flash of light, which is a tiny, tiny amount of energy. In fact, of, of that 100, 90 of them get absorbed by spurious junk in there, and only 10 make it through into the uh, light sensory parts of the retina. So it's a staggering uh, masterpiece of design. I'd just like to know how long ago that this was observed, uh, Einstein. Uh, the Einstein ring was observed in 19, shortly before 1988. The article appeared in Scientific American in 88, so shortly before then. But observation of gravitational lensing is now standard research tool in astronomy. In fact, this, the, uh, the ABC program is upstaged because that program last week was largely on gravitational lensing. Primarily the, the trial by the being so good one point one is that primarily the calcite or is it shape or is it <coughs> compound nature? Does it go on to insects? Do they have the one point one? I don't think so. I don't think the insect's eyes need to be as good at gathering light. The insect eyes are good at um, detecting motion, detecting changes in light levels. But they're not. I don't think they're as good as uh, the trial by eye. Some of the references I consulted on the trial by eye said that none of the Yeah. 
But if you're a little bit off, and let's face it, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit sparse out there, uh, <laughs> you get uh, something that, that, that's halfway between you know, the uh, three images like what I showed you with the wine glass and the ring. And then I've got a wine glass down here. If you want to, you can actually uh, you can see that for yourself. You can, you can get a ring and then shift it off the and you get the two blocks. So how would they, in fact, have to reconstruct the real galaxy as, as you view it without any